Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here this afternoon. My name is Rick Kleffel and I have a website called The Agony Column at agonycolumn.com and I have the great privilege to have with me as my guest and yours, Lee Child. He's the author of 17 Jack Reacher novels from Killing Floor, his very first novel in first edition hardcover, <laughs> to his latest novel, A Wanted Man. Thank you for joining me, Lee. My pleasure, although this is very intimidating. Not only am I the best dressed, which is completely unusual, <laughs> because I, I had a, a very smart event last night, and you know, and I don't carry a bag, and so this is what you see is what you get. I'm also the oldest person here, <laughs> and, uh, and the I dumbest person here, probably. So, uh, <laughs> So this is all very unusual. Uh, Lee, I'd like you to have you read this little paragraph here from the very first book, which I think will give our audience uh, a good taste of how you write and who this man is you write about. Yeah, this was obviously, this was probably written in 1995, I would think, this part. And when I was trying to establish the character of Reacher, told in the first person, and this is how it goes. The coming storm chased me all the way back east. I felt I had more than a storm after me. I was sick with frustration. This morning I had, I had been just one conversation away from knowing everything. Now I knew nothing. The situation had suddenly turned sour. I had no backup, no facilities, no help. I couldn't rely on Roscoe or Finley. I couldn't expect either of them to agree with my agenda. And they had troubles of their own up at the station house. What had Finley said? working under the enemy's nose, and I couldn't expect too much from Picard. He was already way out on a limb. I couldn't count on anybody but myself. On the other hand, I had no laws to worry about, no inhibitions, no distractions. I wouldn't have to think about Miranda, probable cause, constitutional rights. I wouldn't have to think about reasonable doubts or rules of evidence. No appeal to any higher, higher authority for these guys. Was that fair? You bet your ass, they were bad people. They'd stepped over the line a long time ago. Bad people. What did Finley said? As bad as they come. And that gives you, in a nutshell, Lee's main character in these novels, Jack Reacher. And I think that these novels, I was thinking about it today, these novels and this character are an absolute monument to the appeal and the power of pragmatism. Because I think that Jack Reacher is the ultimate pragmatist. Yeah, he is. I mean, absolutely. In, in as much as the character in the book, he's a total pragmatist. He will do whatever needs doing, whichever way it will work. Uh, as a wider issue, I think it goes beyond pragmatism to a kind of consolation for people. Because what Reacher does, Reacher is the judge, the jury, and the executioner. And people say to me, do, don't I worry that, that I am somehow setting a bad example, that uh, you, know, you shouldn't really walk up to somebody and shoot them in the head? And uh, so am I, not, am I not suggesting that we sh you know, this is something that, that is not good? And, I, and I, I say no, because actually, I worked in, in television for a long time, and I've been a writer for a long time now. And the thing that you eventually learn is that even the most ordinary people, even the mass audience as a whole, is very sophisticated at a kind of instinctive level. And they understand completely that if you, that we live in a civilized society where we do need to have rules and laws and rights for the accused and procedures. We absolutely need to have those things. People understand that and they do not disagree with it. But at the same time, it's intensely frustrating. So they turn to fiction for an alternative, an alternative view where you, where you catch the bad guy in real life. Obviously, yeah, you arrest him. You read the Miranda rights. He has a fair trial and so on and so forth. People understand that's necessary, but it's boring. So for fiction, they want to see the guy shot in the head. But the very fact that it's fiction means that they understand that they can't have it in real life. They understand these are not textbooks for how to live. They are kind of consolations for how frustrating uh, real life is. Well, but I think one of the appeals of these books is the textbook-like manner in which you immerse us in Jack Reacher's 
thought process. It is so much fun to read the prose that you write to be in Jack Reacher's head. And he's like a ticking, tick, tick, tick. He's like an instruction manual for how to get back at people. Oh, he sure is. I mean, these are basically revenge stories, and because uh, I love revenge, you know, I think that uh, if if somebody stepped out of line, then then you go get him. And uh, so I, I love that kind of story, and Reacher is really good at that. But Reacher, I mean, it's real funny being here at Google because um, somebody said to me not long ago, Reacher is a very analog guy in a digital age, and he really is. He he, he sticks to these old-fashioned routines, these old-fashioned notions and um, you know there's no gray with reach it's all black or white and uh, as far as that goes he's a, he's a real throwback hundreds if not thousands of years well I think that kind of uh, primitive uh, nature to him is again a big part of his appeal because it cuts to our own kind of reptilian reaction and I'd like you to talk a little bit about just creating that prose voice because you did this in the first person in the first book and then leapt to the third person in the second book. Uh, talk about just finding that right voice. That isn't something that came to you uh, easily, I'm guessing. Well, it was a, it was a conscious decision, really, about uh, the prose had to create the character to a certain extent. And I was imagining a character who's, who's intelligent, who <clears throat> is knowledgeable and so on, but he's very antisocial, he's very isolated, and he doesn't talk a lot. And I've met, I've met one or two people like that, and their manner of talking is very fractured, very fragmented, because they're not accustomed to having conversations. And so they're somewhat incoherent, somewhat uh, stop-start in the way they communicate. Uh, so for the purposes of creating the character, I wanted that kind of naive style, that, as if this is an inarticulate but intelligent person talking to you. Um, I also wanted you know, frankly, to be distinctive commercially, where I, I wanted a style that was identifiably mine. So I, um, I developed that very terse, stripped down. Um, I use a lot of sentence fragments. I uh, ignore most of the rules of grammar. And uh, just to try and make it a, a unique voice, because voice, is, is voice is what storytelling is all about. Um, and if you go to a MFA or some kind of university class and people talk about voice, what they, what, what they tend to mean is just a vague concept about style. You know, voice and style be, become almost interchangeable. And it's really not that at all. Uh, voice is literally a voice. Because what, one of the things that fascinates me is the history of storytelling, which is one of those things that we actually don't know anything about. because. Um, as soon as language was developed amongst humans, which is, you know, several hundred thousand years ago, as far as we can tell, uh, at some point after that, then storytelling was evolved. And we don't know <coughs> when that happened either. <coughs> you know, it's perfectly reasonable to think it could have been 100, 150,000 years ago that we started using our syntactical language abilities to start talking about things that had not happened to people that don't exist. And uh, in other words, making up fiction. But of course, as soon as that first happened, there's no record of it, there's no audio recordings, we don't know anything about it. But we, what we do know is that it was clearly for almost its entire history, up until possibly about 170 years ago, storytelling for most people was mostly oral. It's really only the middle of the 19th century where most regular people started to read off the page. And so almost 99.99% of storytelling's history was oral. And the best sellers, so-called, of, of their day were people with a compelling delivery, with a, an attractive voice and a compelling style, was, would be sitting around uh, telling a story and they had maybe 30 people listening and the next guy along had 10 people listening, so this guy is the bestseller of his day. So storytelling is totally about voice, and voice is a very literal and specific thing. It's the voice of the person telling you the story. The, the more attractive it is, the more into the story you will be. So I felt that developing a voice was uh, absolutely key, and I think you can tell that uh, subliminally. The books that you like, the writers that you like, 
are likely to have some kind of distinctive delivery to their story rather than just a sort of bland uh, normality to it. Well, what you say is so true because uh, humans are a narrative species. We define ourselves through stories. Uh, if I ask you, who are you, you're going to tell me a story. Maybe some fiction or fact in there. Yeah, I mean, that's true. They, there's a movement actually amongst anthropologists, you know, homo sapiens is what they call it. They want to call it pan narans, in other words, the storytelling ape. And it does seem absolutely key that, that we do tell stories. Now, the stories in your books are driven by this man. And one of the things that I think is very interesting about these stories, they're very American. Uh, you obviously are less so. <laughs> well, can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, you do a great job of incorporating, I think, the British part uh, contribution to the mystery genre and incorporating it into your American character. Uh, I'm, I know I'm not the first person to comment on how uh, Jack's a walking Sherlock Holmes. And everything he does, the plots of the books are affected by the fact that everything he looks at, everything he sees, he starts making deductions about. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating that, you know, people say this is a quintessentially American character, and, uh, and that's, only, that's only true in passing. I mean, Reacher is a mythic and legendary character that is, has been around in fairly similar form for, for literally thousands of years. Every, every culture that we know about that has a narrative tradition has invented this character over and over again over the centuries. Uh, the mysterious stranger, the noble loner, the knight errant, the person of some kind of, some odd nobility who is banished from his milieu and sentenced to wander the land doing to do good, either as an imperative or just as a product of his nature. Um, you know, that happens in Japan, the Ronin stories where a samurai is, is disowned by his master and, and just wanders as, as an independent. Uh, happened all through the Middle Ages in Europe, the knight errant. Um, the various key components, the idea of fallen nobility. And Reacher was a, a West Point graduate and a major in the US Army. And that was supposed to give that hint of some status from which he's fallen. And uh, so he is American only in the sense that, that that character has to have an empty, dangerous frontier feel in which to operate, uh, which was fine in Europe seven, eight hundred years ago. Europe was an empty, dangerous continent with a frontier. But of course, over the centuries, Europe became no longer that. So that character was essentially forced to migrate uh, to somewhere where there still was emptiness and a frontier. Um, and certainly those myths started to show up in Australia and the US, um, you know, especially 19th century Westerns. That character, the, the classic, character from the Westerns. You see him all the time in Zane Grey stories. The, the rider that comes in off the range at, the, at exactly the crucial time in exchange for a woman cooked meal, he unsheaths his rifle, takes care of the problem and rides off into the sunset. Now that character seems so American, but it's actually not. It was a direct import from, from medieval Europe. And it wasn't invented in medieval Europe either. It was there a direct import from Scandinavian sagas and legends, and even older Anglo-Saxon legends. There seems to be some, well, clearly, there's a need amongst the audience to have that character, quite clearly, because we would like to have that character. If we're in deep shit, then it's great if we could imagine that somebody will show up in the nick of time and solve our problem for us. So we've invented that character repeatedly. And what all I did was to make to give it a kind of reality-based plausibility in, in the 21st century. Now, one of the things that I think uh, is, does make your work really convincing is you have a, a great vision of America in that you look at the places that most people don't look at. And I'm wondering, you know, the suburbs, the, the kind of the empty parts of the bad cities, the sin city in the, in the, the, the latest book, the the unky part of the cities where people don't go. Um, and I'm wondering, when you, set, when you create these places, do you create them with an idea of, I'm going to have to stage a scene here? And are you like an architect as well, and a city planner as well as a writer? 
Yeah, kind of, although a lot of that is just uh, fascination generally. I mean, I love, uh, I'm, being an outsider, I see everything with a fresh eye, and that is so valuable, I think. You know, I, I gloss over nothing because I've never seen it before. I get, go to any place I go to, I'm seeing for the first time probably, and it makes an impression, and I see the parts that other people no longer see, and, uh, you know, I think that really comes through. I think that's very important. Uh, but I just, yeah, I love the whole thing. I love every scuzzy little thing, every big thing. Um, I was in Vegas one time, and we were in this terrible hotel. Actually, I liked the hotel, but everybody else thought it was terrible. But across the street was this, um, this bar that was nothing but a, a sort of rectangle made out of cinder blocks, painted dirty white, um, probably painted white 18 years ago, and it was all, all filthy. No windows or anything like that. It had a door. It had no sign at all, but it had hand painted in, in, with a fat paintbrush on the wall was its, was its advertisement. Four words, cold beer, dirty girls. <laughs> and I, I, what a place, you know. That, that's, that's the sort of place that I love. Now, uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit about uh, plotting these books. How much of this, each of these books, what's so much fun is that we know pretty much what to expect going into every book, yet they, you manage to, for 17 books, write books that each book feels fresh, they're fun, they're enjoyable, there's a, a, a really powerful vision of America and a gut connection for the reader there. Uh, it, it seems like you must, as a writer, you must be have a kind of Jack Reacher uh, nature for just to adapt to what you have to do? Uh, th well, they're fresh because I took, one, I took one key decision at the very beginning, which was really because I did not want to jump into the same river that everybody else was in. I, didn't, I saw no point in going head to head with established people um, in terms of the shape of their series. And everybody else who writes a series, I think literally everybody else at that time anyway, was writing a series that was, broadly speaking, a soap opera, either location-based or employment-based or both. And, um, you know, typically you would have a cop in L.A. or you would have a private eye in Boston or you would have a police lieutenant in Chicago, and that was the series. And it seemed to me that they were being done so well, why compete with that head-to-head? -head? Plus, it also seemed to me the one the one smart thing I ever did, the one inspired piece of thinking that I ever did is, is I looked ahead. And you can't ever, you can't ever say, yeah, I'm going to write a book and uh, 18 years later I'm still going to be doing it because that's ridiculous, you know, it's very unlikely to happen. But you have to take into account, maybe you will, you know, maybe it might work and maybe you will get 15 or 20 years into it. How are you going to feel then? And I felt that if I had done something that was specifically based somewhere, in something, it would have gotten very boring after, after say, 10 books. So if he had been a cop in New York, th that would have limited me to cop stuff in one particular city. And I, f I foresaw a, a problem with that, so I decided he would not have no job and no location, so that he could be anywhere and do anything. And that's what keeps it fresh for me. But apart, and that also then liberates me to go to do the method that I use, which is not to plot anything. I don't plot, I don't outline, I don't think about it. I just start him out somewhere and see what happens. Really? Yeah, <laughs> I have no, literally no concept of what is the story is going to be about or, or what the thing is going to be or how it's going to end. People say, well, you don't know how it's going to end. I don't know what's going to happen in the next line. And I don't want to know. Because for me, the story is the magic. And if I, if I outlined it, which lots of writers do, you know, they make an outline of varying degrees of detail. If I did that, then I would have told myself the story. I would know how it came out, and I would be bored with it, and I would want to go on to the next story. If I then had to sit down and type out 500 pages worth of that story, I would be bored, because I know how it finishes. It would be like, um, you know, doing it twice. I only want to do it once. So I, I start at the beginning with a, some kind of good idea for the beginning, and then I see what happens. And what happens is, is like real life. We don't know. We have no idea what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen in one hour from now. And um, that's how I write. I, page by page, it's all 
new to me. Well, one of the things I think you do very well too is in the characters who appear, you know, the one, the one book characters, do a great job of giving us characters who have different levels of their faults, they're, you know, incomplete. And in the latest book, we have Sheriff Goodman and we have a couple of agents. Um, and they all have problems. They say, oh man, I made a mistake. These are kind of flawed characters. And I'd like you to talk about just uh, crafting a novel where the flaws of your uh, characters uh, help create the plot. Well, it's, you know, we're very, very weird writers because, you know, I'm not making up a character at all. I'm meeting people. These are real to me. Um, and it's, you know, that's, that's the admission that you have to make. You're sitting there at the computer dealing with people that are real. Um, to, and to me, anyway, the events are real. And often my editor will say to me something like, wouldn't it be better if this happened after that? And I say, well, yeah, it probably would be better. But it didn't. And <laughs> because it's really happening. <clears throat> as far, for the six months I'm writing the book, this is real. And so these characters are just real people to me. I, 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 I sort of dream them up, but then there they are. And I describe them. I let them do whatever it is they're doing. And yeah, they're regular people. They're good at some things, not good at other things. And the flawed stuff, you know, I try and stay away from flawed in, in terms of, of uh, you know, how literary theory goes. You've got to have these flawed characters. I don't like flawed characters. I don't, I don't like miserable people with defects. So as far as possible, I make the characters good at their jobs, decent people. But they do, you know, they make errors, they make mistakes, they have blind spots, and that then creates opportunities for, for, for the story, yeah. One of the things you've done very well, too, is move through all sorts of different kind of genres, I think, within your books. Um, the first book has, a, has I think, a, a distinct element of uh, the horror genre, and it. it's a, the small town with a secret. Uh, and you've had other books where they're more military slant, some are more a mystery slant. And, and uh, I'm wondering how you discover, is that something you just discover as you write, or do you think, yeah. well, maybe it's time to do this kind of novel? No, I'm fairly impatient about genre. I think that, um, you know, this, this endless passing of genre, is this suspense, or is it romantic suspense, or is it horror, or is it this or that? I pay no attention to that at all, because for me as a reader, and everything I do is based on how I feel as a reader. For me as a reader, there are only two kinds of books. There's the kind that will make you miss your stop on the subway, and the kind that don't. It's that simple. And the kind that make you miss your stop can be nonfiction, could be history, could be politics, sociology. If it's, a, if it's an engaging argument, well told, then you're in that book. So I have no patience at all for, oh, I better do something that is slightly more horror or slightly more mystery. Like I say, I just start at the beginning and see what comes out. And I'm, the image that I use to explain it is, uh, you're like a movie stuntman. You're, you're, you've got to fall off a high building. And out of sight of the camera in the street, there's a fire department airbag that you're going to land on, and, uh, or hopefully you're going to land on it. And it's a large airbag. And in one corner, it's marked thriller. In one corner, it's marked mystery. In one corner, it's marked suspense. In one corner, it's marked crime fiction. You're going to land on that bag, but you don't know exactly where. You might be nearer one corner than the other. But you only know that retrospectively. I don't set out thinking, OK, I bet I'm, I'm going to write a sociologically gripping crime fiction book. I just write a book. And somebody else reads it and says, oh, this is a sociologically gripping crime fiction book. And I say, OK, fine, whatever. <laughs> As a keen observer, of American society and more. So I think one of the things you do is, is really give us a raw feeling for the way we look and the way we live. And I think that's really um, part and parcel. That's probably why your books are, are said, described as uh, quintessential American books. Yeah, probably it, it probably takes a foreigner to you know observe this stuff in that kind of detail or with that kind of perspective. I don't know, but you know you, you mentioned Sherlock Holmes earlier on, and that's um, uh, that's indicative of of, a, of the relationship that a writer has with the with the apparent effect. Because Sherlock Holmes, I I, I love Sherlock Holmes. Um, 
but from a writer's perspective, it's just the most outrageous con trick of all time. Um, because you've got Sherlock Holmes, who's, who's whatever he's doing, smoking his pipe. He's looking out the window of Baker Street, and he sees this guy walking towards his door. And he says to Watson, ah, Watson, clearly this is a, a baker from Shoreditch who's been out of work for exactly nine months. And sure enough, the guy shows up in the living room, and he says he's a baker <coughs> from Shoreditch who's been out of work for nine months, and Sherlock Holmes looks like a genius. Except it's Conan Doyle who's writing both ends of that transaction. Of course he's right. Um, in reality, he says, the guy would come up and say, no, I'm not. I'm a bricklayer from Islington, or something like that. Um, so that's, with all of this so-called perception, and um, it's, it looks great because I'm, I'm defining both ends of the deal. So uh, it, it's largely an illusion, that more than anything else. Well, that's, I think, the, the real key to being uh, an effective writer of anything is the release of information. And one of the things that you do very well, and, and especially in the latest book, is we see this set of events and we know this, and we see that set of events and we know that, and we know everything that's going on. And as readers, it's re part of the fun for us is to see the characters catch up with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's what, two ways of doing it. You either state the circumstances and let the reader be more powerful than the characters, or vice versa. You, uh, you have a, conf a confusing mystery, and the characters lead the reader through it. Um, both, ways, both ways work really well, because there's really only one, there's really only one technique that, that works in a book in, of this type, in my opinion, a suspense book. I mean, suspense is a strange word to use for a book, because all books have suspense in them. Otherwise, why would anybody ever finish one? There's got to be some reason why you keep going to the end. But I suppose what we call suspense fiction emphasizes the suspense. And you get into all kinds of, you know, there are dozens of classes and dozens of courses. And they all have a, uh, one of the modules is entitled, how, how do you create suspense? And my feeling about that is that the very form of that question immediately leads you down the wrong path because the form of the question, how do you create suspense, is a kind of active question similar to how do you bake a cake? And we all know how to bake a cake, or at least, you know, theoretically we do. Not that I've ever baked one, but I've seen it done. And what you do with baking a cake is you have some ingredients, and you have the clear implication that the higher quality of the ingredients, the better the cake is going to be you know you've got to mix these ingredients together, again, with the clear implication that the more thoroughly and conscientiously you mix them together, the better the cake will be. You then put it in the oven with the implication that the more exact the temperature and timing, the better the cake will be. So you immediately start to think of that as a process question. And it's the wrong question for suspense. The real question is not how do you bake a cake, it is how do you make your family hungry? And the way you make your family hungry is you make them wait four hours for dinner. <laughs> and that's what you do with the book. You, you imply a question, and then you do not answer it until the end of the book. And, and you do that as you go along in miniature. You imply a question. You don't answer it until the end of the chapter or the end of the paragraph, or even your sentence construction. You flip it around so that you're, the first half of the sentence is answered by the second half of the sentence. And that creates this unstoppable momentum. Because if there's one thing that humans are hardwired to do, it is to wait around for the answer to a question. We learned that in television a long time ago. I worked in television from, from the end of the 70s to the middle of the 90s. And we had a, a huge revolution uh, went on in, in, in the way we did it. There was something that nobody had in 1980 that everybody had in 1990 that absolutely revolutionized the way that we worked. Um, and you notice I, have, I haven't said what it was. You're now thinking, well, what did it, nobody have in 1980? That every, because I've implied a question and I'm not answering it. And you, you, you want to know, right? What nobody had in 1980 and they did have in 1990 was a remote control. So that in the old days, your sequencing of programming you could get away with a lot because if somebody wanted to change a the channel, they'd have to get their ass off the sofa and go and do it. And you could rely on the fact that they probably wouldn't. 
By 1990, it was dead easy to change channels. They would be flipping around. As soon as anything stopped, the end of a part, a commercial, anything, they would be changing channels like mad. And we had to work out a way of defeating that. And we started out, we invented a process that is, it still exists in sports now. I mean, it's, it's the last remnant is visible in sports, particularly baseball, where during the fourth inning, typically in the fourth inning of baseball, people have got some idea of the way the game is going their initial impulse to watch baseball is fading away. So the top, at, the, at the end of the top of the fourth, you ask a trivia question. Like, who was the pitcher who gave up Lou Gehrig's first grand slam? And then you do the commercials, and then you answer the trivia question at, at the beginning of the bottom of the fourth. And if, even, if you, even if you know who gave up Lou Gehrig's first Grand Slam. Even if you don't care, even if you've never heard of Lou Gehrig, even if you don't know what a Grand Slam is, there is something that makes you want to stick around for that answer. And uh, it's, that's very powerful with humans. And, and that's the way to create suspense. You ask a, a question, and then you refuse to answer it for hundreds of pages. And p people will stick around for it. And the, the key text in, the, in that area is a book by John Grisham, who in, you know, John Grisham's a very popular author, often overlooked in terms of quality, but he's a very smart guy, Grisham, I think, and underestimated in terms of how experimental he is. And he did this one book called The Runaway Jury. And none of the classic elements are present in The Runaway Jury. People tell you you've got to have sympathetic characters that you care about, so you, you follow them through their perils and all that kind of stuff. Runaway Jury has got no sympathetic characters. It has bad guys and worse guys. It has no, nothing in it whatsoever except what is the verdict going to be in this trial? And that's the only question. And you read that book like a locomotive because you need the answer. Now, uh, what, what shows did you work on? When I was in television, yeah. I, worked on, I worked for Granada Television in Manchester, England, which was at that time a tremendous drama producer, also documentary producer, but drama-wise, you saw it all over Masterpiece Theatre. We did Brideshead Revisited, Jewel in the Crown, Crime Suspect, Cracker, all those um, great British shows. Well, that's, that explains that. <laughs> Now, uh, one of the things that I think makes uh, these books really fun to read, too, is you have a very absolutely deadpan sense of humor. I mean, it's just smashed to the ground and, 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 and so flat we can barely see it. But it's really there. And that, they're, your books, they're hilarious. I think so, yeah. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't, you know, the humor is not the first thing people think about when they think about a Reacher book, but I think he is very funny, yeah, but, you know, very subliminal, stealth humor, very, very sardonic, and um, I like those parts a lot. Uh, I like writing them, yeah. When, as you've been creating the character, one of the things that's nice about him is that even though he lives entirely outside of society, and he's, uh, I guess what you'd call off the grid, he has none of the kind of unsavory taint of a survivalist or somebody who claims to be off the grid. And that's a delicate balancing act, I think, for you. Yeah, I mean, off the grid does imply that you're, you know, some kind of weirdo or you are planning secession, you know, you want to make Montana a separate country or something. Uh, and he's not that kind of off the grid person. He just doesn't want to live anywhere. He doesn't want the hassle of owning a house or dealing with anything. So he takes advantage of the available infrastructure, which is fantastic in America. You have constant parade of, of diners and motels and little stores and diners and motels. Why would anybody do, any, do it any different, uh, is Reach's opinion. For 20 bucks a night, you can find a place to stay. You can buy a new outfit for 25, 30 bucks. You can eat in a diner for four or five. Why would he want a house? Uh, he has this rigorously logical approach. What would a house bring him uh, that he wants? And the answer is nothing. So it's, it's not so much that he's off the grid. He is just uh, a wanderer. Now, because, yeah, that's true, because he doesn't, it's not like he's, a, he's not opposed to government or the rules of no. society. No, he's, he was respectful of the hierarchy in the army. He's got no problem with hierarchy in general or, the, or government or anything like that. He's got no, it's purely utilitarian for him. Uh, why doesn't he carry a cell phone? Well, who would ever call him? You know, there's no point in it. So he won't do anything that there's no point in. 
Well, of course, if you told uh, us all, everybody here 20 years ago, um, the government's going to strap a, a radio control device so you can, we can locate you at any moment. And I think that's in this book, too. Yeah, I, th I think that is fantastic, <laughs> actually. That, you know, think back 20, 25 years. If, if a bill had gone to Congress saying that every American must wear a wireless transponder so that he can be tracked everywhere all the time, there would have been total outrage. But of course, we've done it to ourselves uh, voluntarily, which is very strange. Along with ubiquitous uh, surveillance, too, since we can not now as film bad ourselves. As it, yeah, but not as bad as it is in, in London, for instance. I mean, that really is a surveillance society. Um, one quarter of the entire planet's CCTV cameras are in London. And any, any any person, any one, of, you know, any one of you go to, to London for some reason, you are on some camera all day and all night. It's really bizarre. Now, do we have any questions from the audience? Hi. So this is not quite about your writing style, but more about sort of your opinion. So as you know, there's a movie coming out. And um, I was kind of curious to know your thoughts of the casting. Um, and I bring this up because obviously Jack Reacher is like six foot five and you know he's fair haired and blonde eyed and then in the movie he's not quite depicted the same way. He's a lot shorter and darker haired and you know, et cetera. So and I also saw his face on one of your books at the airport and so I was like, Oh my god, that's like totally not representative. <laughs> so I was just kinda curious sort of your thoughts on that. Like did you have any say or it was just kind of like surprise? Uh, no, I had, I had uh, you know, not contractually, not legally, uh, because typically a movie contract is very, very restrictive. And, uh, you know, a movie contract is, is a hilarious thing legally. It's, generally speaking, longer than the book. And um, it has all kinds of bizarre clauses. You know, by the time you reach page 400, you realize what, what it is you're actually selling. And what you're selling is a license for a dramatic production to be shown anywhere in the known universe. And then there's a writer saying, or parts not yet discovered. <laughs> um, you know, it's an immense, it's a huge binding thing, a movie contract, with no, uh, really, if an author asks for approval or veto or anything like that, that's the same thing as, um, as, as, as just not selling it, because they won't do it, because it needs to be done, it can't be done by committee. This is their project. Um, and, but having said all of that, the people that made this movie are out and out crazed Reacher fans. Uh, they totally are. They are, uh, you know, they know as much as he does about the books. They know, they have read the books obsessively. They, they love the character. So they were very, very nice to me. They included me at every step of the way. I, I bet more than any author has ever been included. And of course, there were two key points. One. People say, Do, did I have a say? And I say, yes, I did. I had 100% total control because I, it was my choice whether to sell it or not. If I sold it to the movies, that's one decision. If I didn't, that's another decision. So there is 100% control. And then what happened, the, the movie took a long time to get off the ground because it's complicated making movies. You've got to assemble the, uh, everybody's got to say yes on the same day. And the, the odds against that happening are like winning the Powerball. So it takes years and years and years. And of course, during those years and years and years, the books were doing very well. The books were growing bigger and bigger and bigger as a book franchise. So by the time the movie actually went into production, the books were important enough in the world that they had to approach it very respectfully. Not that they would have, wouldn't have wanted to, because like I said, they were big fans of the books. But it didn't mean I was included more, because not so much because they needed my input on anything, because they were completely sure about how to do it. It wasn't that they wanted my input. They just wanted to kind of celebrate with me. You know, look, we're doing this. This is happening. It's, it's working. It's, it's, it's going to be here. So I was very involved. And um, again, there was a point where the finance was there. The, the whole thing was, was rolling. It was just about the cast, who was, who was going to be cast. And um, we went to dinner, and they said, we want Tom Cruise to play Reacher. And I know for a fact that if I had freaked out at that point, they would have abandoned it, I'm certain. But I didn't freak out, because in a, in a wider sense, uh, and this is something, again, that fascinates me, that a book exists entirely in the imaginative realm. Okay, and I honestly believe that a book is a two-way transaction. 
that my imagination specifically and your imagination specifically together create the book. I've put something into it, the act of reading, you put something into it, then the book exists. And it can be incredibly vivid and incredibly detailed and hyper real, but it's in the imaginative realm. There is no reality to it. Then, if you want to make a movie out of it, even though the movie is, again, fiction and it's a story and it's full of magic and tricks and all that kind of stuff, fundamentally a movie exists in the physical world. It's no longer purely imaginative, it's in the physical world because you've got to have real people uh, and they're acting in real spaces. And so you jump from the imaginative to the physical and as soon as you do that, the physical reality starts to define things. In terms of the casting, for instance, the physical reality is that the actor has to exist. You know, it's that simple. You've got to choose one of the pool of existing actors. And so, yeah, Reacher is six foot five in the books, and he's um, ugly, and he's got, you know, he's got scars, and he's generally speaking a little bit sort of beat up looking and huge and so on. So you think, fine. So you, you go to Hollywood and you start to look for that actor. You're not going to find that actor because that actor does not exist. There's something about the technology of film uh, and cameras in general. And again, I learned this years ago in television that something odd about the lens that will not accommodate big people which is really why there are no big actors. There are literally no big actors, none at all. And so if you're going to make a movie, you've got to deal with the, the existing pool of real physical actors, and you've got to pick one. And therefore, it becomes immediately apparent that there's no, there's no way we're going to get a, an exact physical match for Reacher, because that actor does not exist. And you can say, well, yeah, but what about this guy? What about that guy? What about this other guy? And you know, that conversation has been going on for a year and a half. What about this guy? Well, that guy's dead. Um, <laughs> what about this guy? Well, that guy's 103 years old. And so it goes back and forth, and you end up with a kind of uh, short list of, of potential suggestions, all of whom are not very big, because, as I said before, there are no big actors. You're talking about this guy who's two inches bigger than this other guy, and they're both eight inches shorter than Reacher, so why worry about it? So what I, what I wanted to do, ultimately, in that split second that I had to think about it in that restaurant when they told me that they wanted to cast Tom Cruise is, it was clear that we were never going to get the outside of Reacher because that is just not available. So what I wanted to do was to get the inside of Reacher as close as possible. And again, I know actors, I've worked with them all my life when I was when I was 22 years old, almost 23 to be fair, I worked with, with four actors, Laurence Olivier, John Gielgud, Alec Guinness, and Ralph Richardson, who were, who were pretty heavyweight actors. And so I, I, I'm familiar with actors. I know what they can do. You can, you can sort of look at their past body of work, and you can figure out what are they capable of. And I felt that Cruz was absolutely 100% capable of doing the inside of Reacher, the stillness, the quiet, the menace, the intensity. Uh, he could do that, and uh, therefore, I was really happy about it, really happy about it. And uh, I've seen the movie twice, and it absolutely nails it. So it's this very strange thing. It's like looping the loop in a, in a small airplane. You have to go away from the book in order to come back to it. And, uh, you know, the casting has caused a lot of consternation, and I'm deeply grateful about that, frankly, because as the, the idea that I've created this character that people actually care who plays him in the movies is a wonderful thing. You know, that's the biggest possible compliment. I'm thrilled by it. But we are in this awkward situation at the moment where the movie comes, comes out December 21st, and I sincerely hope you go see it, because if you do see it, you're going to think, you know what, that was pretty good, because he, he nails it. Well, one of the things that uh, struck me when you were talking was how vivid your books are as reading experiences. And I think that's one of the things that is, makes them so powerful to us. And I think they, they, this kind of work stands right next to any um, kitchen window epiphany piece of literature, I think, in terms of getting us connecting to our, our narrative reading 
instinct. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about uh, as a connecting with readers on that level of language, that kind of reptile level of experience. Yeah, well, I think that, uh, uh, you know, part of, part of the answer to that is, is what I said earlier at the beginning of the, of the movie answer, which is that it is a two-way street. Um, I, I don't think we can underestimate that. I don't mean in terms of the work done. I do all the work. You have all the fun. But your, uh, your imagination is just as crucial in this transaction as mine is. Um, it's a collaborative exercise. It's what you leave out. Yeah, and therefore, actually, if you leave stuff out, if you are, if you're quite, uh, if you leave the characters and the situation as an empty vessel to a certain extent, that leaves room for the reader's imagination to swarm in there and fill in the details with their own convictions. And I think that's what makes a successful reading experience. Give the reader enough room to um, <clears throat> to do some of it themselves, because Reacher, for instance. Uh, is never really described in, other than very vaguely. His, his general shape and size, his general you know, hair color or whatever, he's not really described at all, and yet everybody has a very specific image of what he looks like, and that's because they're investing. You know, the, the room is there, and they're occupying it with their own projection. And I think that is what makes, uh, it's my reptile brain connected to theirs, and together we're creating this story. Uh, and I think the, the sort of books that don't work are the sort of books that over-specify everything and, and try and dominate the reader, try and command the reader rather than give the reader room and opportunity. Now, when you're, one of the things that we like about these books is the way you, from book to book we never know what's going to happen with Reacher and the women in the books. And I think you, t <laughs> you, uh, you seem to be, have a little bit of a devil in you with, with regards to that. <laughs> Well, you know, the women in the books, uh, there's been a couple of books where he, he does not get laid. And, um, you know, that is uh, a tragedy, really. But like I, 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 don't, I don't really, like I said, I don't plan it. And uh, it got to the fifth book, I think. And there was this lawyer, I think she was called Alice. She was a, a lawyer down in Texas. She's from New York, and she's representing um, disadvantaged people in Texas. And I... She was this really nice character, and uh, so I was imagining, sure, okay, here we go. This is the love interest in this book, but then she sort of turned out to be gay. There was this little exchange where she just, just she was gay, and that was that. And so he, <coughs> he had not, he, he was unrequited in that book. And but generally speaking, yeah, you know, you think about it from my point of view. Like I said, these people are real to me. So I'm sitting there in my office, and I'm going to spend five or six months with a made-up woman. And you better believe she's going to be cute. And uh, I mean, why would I, make, why would I make up a woman that, that was a dog? You know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to have a good six months. So I'm, I'm sitting there with this made-up person, and uh, yeah, she's going to be cool, absolutely. And so I'm into her. Reach is going to be into her. I believe that our time is up for this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've been privileged to have with us one of America's and the world's foremost writers, Lee Child. And you can buy his books. He'll sign them. I'd say buy this one. You have, if you've never read him before, you have 16 fabulous books to read. It's so it, the thrill of looking forward to stuff, to this, these books, is just You'll find out. You will find out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.